healthcare. We have a significant amount of bureaucratic layers that we're required to do, uh, but oftentimes we make things harder than they need to be. To your point about new technologies, new therapeutics, all of that, we're seeing that no longer can you be sort of the generalist of all things. We've tried to have traditionally done primary care as a one size fits all. And I think as healthcare entities, we have to evolve that. Dr. Stephen T. Hester is Senior Vice President, System Chief Clinical and Strategy Officer, Norton Healthcare. He joined Norton in 2004 as Chief Medical Information Officer and has served in a number of medical staff and leadership positions in his time since. Prior to joining Norton Healthcare, Dr. Hester practiced emergency medicine full-time, working for Kentuckiana Emergency Physicians to improve quality and volume. The game is about how you get the best talent uh, to take care of patients, and uh, that, that'll be the continuing challenge in the future. Dr. Hester holds a bachelor's and medical degree from the University of Louisville and an MBA from Bellarmine University. He serves on multiple national committees and boards focused on improving the delivery of healthcare for patients. He also serves on the board of directors of the Christian Academy School System and Leadership Louisville. Make sure that if you want grace as you're going through your leadership journey, uh, you need to be sure you give grace. Let's join the conversation as Dr. Hester shares his vision of leadership in healthcare. Well, good afternoon, Steve, and welcome. Thanks, Gary. It's so good to be here. Well, it's great to have you at the microphone. You know, this show is about leadership excellence. You've certainly displayed that in your multiple year career at Norton Health. What did the young Steve think about leadership? You know, it was interesting. So growing up, I grew up, I was fortunate to grow up here in Louisville. And uh, so from that standpoint, I've been able to stay at home, which has been great. Uh, but, you know, one of the things from a leadership perspective really had an interest growing up early. I mean, even in high school, I was involved in a number of student government activities. Uh, I think back and remember that, you know, I started out one of the first things I did. I was president of Students Against Drunk Driving. And I remember leading a large meeting and somebody leaning over and saying, hey, you know, as the leader of the meeting, you don't necessarily need to speak as much. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, when you're at the chair, it seems easy to sort of take control of things and run. And so right. a little life lesson I've had forever. Well, when did you become interested in medicine, Steve? I was really fortunate that when I was a, a freshman uh, in high school, one of the uh, there was a local surgeon here who did the first artificial heart transplant. Wow. And, and uh, he showed up and actually just re recently after he had done that, showed us videos in the OR and everything. And, you know, from that point, I was really just fascinated by it. I mean, I've always liked science, but really fascinated by the impact. And so I'd say that was a big piece for me to really just to develop the overall interest. And in, uh, he made mm -hmm. an impact on me that day. So were you always interested in emergency medicine or did that come uh, once you worked your way through medical school? You know, interestingly, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. And so, uh, you know, when you look at that, I, I would say that I really went to medical school, to be honest, not even knowing about all the subspecialties. Uh, and so learned a lot in that phase as I got there and found out where I had interest. And, you know, I love the, the ability to sort of quickly solve problems and be able to move on to the next thing. Uh, and so I enjoyed that a lot early in my career. For sure. Well, uh, you practiced. Uh as an ER physician for, I think, roughly five years and and then went to Norton as a full-time leader as a CMIO. What prompted that move from being a practicing physician to uh, basically a hospital administrator? Well, you know, one of the things I was fortunate early in my career is we had a group of about 75 physicians. And uh, from that perspective, we didn't, uh, you know, oftentimes we didn't have somebody who really wanted to step up and be the lead for the group. And so there was a leadership position that opened. Uh, I sort of took on from a managing partner standpoint uh, and really got involved from a leadership perspective in the practice. And so uh, actually did that. And then when I switched into the CMIO role, continued to practice for a number of years after that as well oh, okay. at, a, at, a, at, a, at a different pace for sure. And uh, but really just enjoy the leadership uh, opportunities because, you know, the, imp the ability to make a big impact um, in, in a different way, I thought was something I was really excited about. Someone who likes change. And so it was a good opportunity to, to make a change. 
Well, you've certainly been a terrific leader during your time uh, there. So can you describe Norton Healthcare for us, please, Steve? Sure. So we're, you know, we're a regional system, health system located uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we've got six hospitals that basically uh, we do about 70,000 admissions a year, about three and a half billion in revenue, uh, you know, and 18,000 employees. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, we've got pretty nice density here in this this region and a little bit in southern Indiana. Uh, we've also got the, the state's only freestanding pediatric hospital. And so from that perspective, have been fortunate to be able to see growth. Um, you know, over the years that I've been here, we started out, I think we had about uh, 145 employed physicians and we've got about 1800 employed providers now. So a lot of growth over that time and certainly a lot of changes. Well, you're now the division president and system chief medical officer. Can you share your responsibilities and your priorities for us, Steve? One of the things that comes in first there is just quality of patient care. Uh, we want to make sure we're doing the right things for patients and, and, and for our employees as well, so they can you know, provide the, the best care for patients. Uh, but from a responsibility standpoint, you know, uh, again, over the years, been fortunate to have a great team of people do a tremendous number of things. And big responsibilities, obviously, for our, our practices. Uh, we've got nearly 300 locations there, and, and that's a big piece of the work, the service line work. Uh, have a tremendous responsibility for quality, for clinics and clinical operations, uh, you know, care management, care and process improvement. Uh, I've got teams who uh, work on those things, then also really for uh, strategy for the organization. And so, you know, strategic plan has been a big part of that. So I've been fortunate to be able to have a great team and be able to have a breadth of responsibilities. So how have how, do, how does the division president separate from the system CMO? What's the distinction there, Steve? Uh, really just a lot more operational responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at that, it's more of sort of breaking that into those, uh, those individual practices, uh, making sure. And again, a lot of that is the way we organize service lines, uh, you know, interacts really across the entire enterprise. And when you think about the growth opportunities and what happened in the organization, uh, it really does center around that programmatic subspecialty service line structure. And so that's a big part of that. Well, it's it's hard to go through an interview with a, an executive of a large health system without asking about COVID. Um, what, what toll did COVID take on Norton Healthcare? You know, we were certainly more fortunate than some of the other areas. And there were some places that really got hit hard. But I would say that we, we did have a, a really tough battle with that as well. And, you know, the challenge, I think, was just the day to day uh, operational challenges of knowing if you had supplies, what was going to come next. I mean, when we deal with just like this year, a flu or an RSV season. We've got experience there. We know what's going to happen. I think the unknown was what created a lot of challenges for our healthcare staff, our providers. Um, and I think that, that bared a toll over a long period of time. Uh, you know, on the flip side of that, I would say there were some things that I would say really did um, were, were somewhat of a positive. Uh, one of the challenges where we got very nimble, uh, you know, there were a number of times you need to make a decision and we would action on it the next day. Um, you also looked around and found young talent that you needed to uh, take on a big responsibility and where you might have spent more time, you know, uh, letting them slowly go into that. Uh, we just said, hey, you've got to run and we need the help in going with it. And so those people were able to excel and show their talents. And so, I, it, you know, it, it certainly was a challenge. And I think that we've seen um, uh, uh, we saw a lot of resiliency through that, but we're still feeling the effects of that uh, as we go on every day. Is there anything special that you can do for the medical staff to try to uh, make things better for them when they're under all the stress that COVID and now the flu and RSV suggests? You know, one of the things in terms of uh, making sure everybody can do their job as efficiently as possible, I think, is oftentimes, you know, in healthcare. We have a significant amount of bureaucratic layers that we're required to do, uh, but oftentimes we make things harder than they need to be. And so from that perspective, we really spent a lot of time looking to say, how do we optimize that workflow? Uh, how do we take away some of that burden? Uh, how do we look at additional resources that can help you know, physicians practice 
uh, and focus on patients uh, rather than some of the other tasks and challenges that, that creep in. Let's look at some healthcare trends. In particular, the chief medical officer, which has been a key role in the large health systems as they've evolved. How would you say the CMO role, Steve, has changed over, let's say, the last 10 or 15 years? Yeah, I would say, you know, traditionally this role, I think, was much more of the medical director. Uh, what I would consider, you know, you found a physician who was nearing the end of uh, their career and maybe would say, hey, do you want to do some some things to help us on some peer review and look at some quality metrics and some things of that nature. But I think the role has certainly evolved and I, I've been fortunate to sort of be here during that evolution. And I think um, a lot of that, I think, uh, is allowing th that role to be much more operational. Uh, I think you're seeing a lot more physicians with the business acumen that are driving and, and getting even further education on that from that perspective as well. But I think also, um, even on the analytics side, you know, we're seeing such change from that perspective and the way we're using analytics in healthcare that that's a big part of what we do. And I think on the CMO side, it's more of how you're translating that analytics to look for operational efficiencies. Um, and then a big part also in the strategic planning, because I think it's so crucial now that uh, you get that sort of physician translation uh, as to what's happening, you know, in, in the community and how you can be nimble uh, to be successful from a business perspective. How, how are physicians handling innovation in everything from pharmacies to arthroscopic surgery to technology? Uh, is it overwhelming or exciting or how do physicians look at these major, major changes in clinical practice? You know, I think it's, there's a couple phases of that. Like first, it depends on what age you are in terms of how long you've been practicing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as we age, we get probably a little less nimble and, uh, and certainly in terms of that and a little farther away from some of the technologies. But, you know, we've got certainly as an exam, a great example of that is just the robotics and surgery. Yeah. I mean, clinicians coming out of fellowship and residency couldn't be more comfortable with that technology. Uh, it's where folks who've been out for a while may still be adapting to that. And I think one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is that uh, subspecialization for all areas. And I think to get to your point about new technologies, new therapeutics, all of that, we're seeing that no longer can you be sort of the generalist of all things. Um, and even in the specialty side. So you may see, in, you know, we see it really obviously in orthopedics. You know, a clinician will come out and focus on hips or knees. They'll focus on shoulder. They'll focus on foot. And so they want to get that excellence they can to that from that perspective. Uh, but even in areas like neurology, you know, someone will focus on seizure, MS. And so those are some of the things that I think we're seeing a change where folks are trying to get to a place, clinicians are trying to get to a place where they're subspecialized. And that really allows them to have a greater focus and I think be up to date on new technologies and new therapeutics. What does that mean for primary care? Are we seeing um, a shortfall in primary care physicians? For sure. I mean, we don't, we don't nearly have enough primary care physicians and you combine that and we're seeing a lot of advanced practice providers providing that primary care. You know, I think I, I saw a recent statistic that sort of, it showed that 25% of all uh, primary care is happening in an urgent care center. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, what we traditionally think of as a relationship for primary care, traditionally we'll think of, I want a primary care doctor who sort of cares with me and is through me year after year. Uh, we're seeing a change. And right now, I think if you're, if you're under 40, uh, you see primary care as a commodity. Uh, it's when I need it. Uh, when I need it, when I want it. And so a little bit of that, you're seeing people choose different avenues than you would have normally exposed in terms of that. So I think as health systems, we have to be adapting uh, to provide that because there's a difference in a healthy 45 year old who may need some screenings here and there versus a uh, 50 year old with diabetes and maybe another comorbidity that needs more chronic care. And so you're trying to have traditionally done primary care as a one size fits all. And I think as healthcare entities, we have to evolve that. 
I mean, it seems like most graduates of the residencies and fellowship programs are becoming employed. A uh, big change from 10 or 15 years ago. Is that influencing the your point about subspecialties? I mean, does the employment model allow them to focus more on a subspecialty or not? You know, I think it does. You know, there was a book, and I don't remember the exact date, but I'm thinking about 2008, Redefining Healthcare by Michael Porter. And it's interesting because one of the things he highlighted in that book was creating disease-specific clinics. And I remember reading through that at the time and thinking how challenging that is to get that to function in that way. But I do think we're starting to evolve that way now with the employment models. Um, because you're finding patients with a primary chronic disease process and saying, how do I get them into the most efficient model of care? And a great example of that is a patient with MS. Uh, you know, they've got clinics that are subspecialized there with not just the neurologist who's doing that subspecialization, but someone who helps manage the other portions of that disease. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that happen in the employment structure. And I think that does drive individuals to have the opportunity to be more subspecialized uh, than maybe they would have been certainly in a primary, in a uh, pr private practice model. Uh, you, you wouldn't do that with those support resources or be able to financially sustain it. Let's look at the EMR for a moment because it relates to this discussion. Is the EMR actually changing the practice of medicine, Steve? You know, I think it is. I think it's in a number of ways. And I think we're still, you know, one of the things in, uh, there are some to take that. No one should take this wrong, but there are some great EMRs out there uh, who do, do great things. I think when I think of the evolution of the EMR right now, um, the challenge is if you've ever seen NBA 2K, uh, it's a fun game, fun game, great graphics. Everything works great on it. Almost looks like a real game. We think that the EMR should sort of be that advanced. The challenge is the EMR in terms of EMRs, I, I feel like we're still at the Pong stage, uh, you know, and we're advancing. And I think it's advancing really, really quickly. But you think about things about how we document. We've sort of still in that phase where we took paper charts and created the paper charts in an electronic format. And that next evolution of things, I think, will certainly change for providers, whether it's how we do dictation, uh, to text or how we do video uh, documentation, all of those pieces are going to evolve, you know, as storage capacity increases and things of that nature. But I think right now the EMR is still a bit of a challenge in a practice setting for providers uh, because it puts a significant burden on documentation. And I'm not sure we completely get the value out of all of that documentation. You know, I do think one of the things that certainly the portability of the information is incredible. Um, you know, you don't no longer have a single chart in one place. Patients have access through patient portals. Uh, they're able to get that access instantly. They get results instantly. So I think there are so many positive things there, but we've got a long way to go in terms of, I think, making yeah. it a great process for us. Well, to the consumer access to the portal and the information, is that allowing Norton to be more responsive to consumer and get them more involved? Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the great examples I'll give on that is, you know, we want our goal is to get uh, a mammogram result to a patient really in less than an hour. And we're close to that. I mean, we're right there on the cusp of that. And it's how do we do that in such a way that, you know, a woman comes in for a mammogram and, you know, the worst part about that is the anxiety of knowing you've had that right. exam, not knowing the result. And so how do we get through that process quickly for all patients as they come in? And so I think you can replicate that in a number of areas, but that's a great example of where the EMR is offering efficiency for that. Um, and I think that rapid access to results uh, really does change. Online scheduling, great opportunity in terms of patient efficiency. And so we really do need to work as we continue to see how we minimize that chaos and challenges for patients. Looking at large cap companies like CVS and Walgreens, Walmart, uh, now Amazon, that are elbowing their way into primary care, does that concern you, Steve? You know, I don't think it's a concern. I think one of the things is everybody's trying to see what they can do um, to improve care for patients. 
And I think from a competitive standpoint, those are great. They make everybody better. We're all looking for new ideas and new innovations. And so I think it advances markets. Uh, I think the challenge is, um, you know, it does get hard when you pick certain pieces off of an overall business entity. And I, to give you an example, we, I was talking with a large group of CMOs uh, earlier this week, and we talked about, um, you know, investments in the underserved areas and the importance of that. I mean, we're making a, a significant investment in a hospital in an underserved area of the community. Um, and that's very important for the health and wellness of those patients, as well as the wellness of our community. Uh, but that happens when you have an entire ecosystem of care happening uh, in terms of the way reimbursements function. And so that's an important piece for us to be able to look at that ecosystem. And when you, I think oftentimes you find that uh, areas that are making huge investments pull off those areas that support those investments in, in underserved areas and, uh, and for care that's needed for individuals who have difficulty with access. Yeah. I mean, it certainly seems to give physicians another option. Um, what's your thought about about that? And are the physicians happy at uh, CVS and Optum and so on? You know, I think, again, you know, I think part of it is we're seeing it more than ever, not just with physicians, but with nursing, every, every uh, techs, every employee we have that through the pandemic, I think we've all sort of reset um, what work looks like. And, you know, based on that, everybody's still trying to figure out what they want from a work perspective. And so I think there are a number of individuals, and a great example of that is behavioral health. Uh, one of the things we saw during the pandemic was that behavioral health really did take off from a telemedicine standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of great things there because some individuals aren't comfortable talking in person and you can do some things over a screen for privacy. And so I think you're seeing an area where those individuals who want to deliver behavioral health via telemedicine are able to do that. And so I think we're going to see that a lot of these, a lot of these groups are trying to find individuals to attract talent, uh, see what they can do. And uh, I think everybody's going to be vying it as we have for years. The, the, the game is about how you get the best talent uh, to take care of patients. And uh, that, that'll be the continuing challenge in the future. So, Steve, this has been a terrific interview, as we fully expected. I've got two last questions, if I could. One is, and I'm sure you're asked this all the time, what advice do you give for young people that might be interested in medicine when they come to you and ask you that question? You know, one of the things for me is there's nothing better than taking care of patients. Uh, there's no better reward when you go home in the day and know that you've made an impact to change somebody's life. Uh, you know, and I heard a speech a number of years ago from, uh, it's, it's been on YouTube so viral. It's uh, Admiral McRaven giving the uh, commencement address at the University of Texas. And one of the things he talks about is if you want to change the world and, you know, and he really focuses on you do it one sort of one person at a time. And I think there's no better place in healthcare than healthcare than to say that you can make changes and you can change the world one person at a time. And so, you know, I think it's it's easy for individuals to say, hey, it's stressful, it's challenging, and it is, uh, but it's very rewarding because there's no better thing to do than to, to make an impact on someone and share your talents uh, to help make a change in their life. Same question about healthcare leaders and up and coming leaders, Steve. What advice do you give to those who come to you for advice on how to proceed in their career? You know, one of the things for me first, is I think they, they've got to be comfortable with change. Uh, you know, it's one of the things when you think about healthcare, we're constantly evolving. Uh, it feels like there are a lot of similarities, but there are constant changes. And so, you know, you've got to be a comfortable as a change leader. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, that is very hard. It's hard to get individuals to follow you uh, when you're constantly trying to innovate and make change. And so to me, that's one of the things that I think is going to be important uh, for anyone that's a leader. And then one of the things that I'm constantly reminding my uh, my team about is uh, to make sure that if you want grace as you're going through your leadership journey, uh, you need to be sure you give grace uh, because there is a lot of challenges that are ahead. And uh, you can only do that with great people around you. 
And so making sure you're focused on that is going to be so important. This is great, Steve. Thanks so much again. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks.